Hello everyone, welcome to Insight. I'm Courtney Lewis and I'm joined by Tony Nichol today. This weekend's concert features two wonderful pieces of music, Mozart's C minor piano concerto and Sibelius's first symphony. And to accompany that, Tony is going to make us a drink called The Last Word. <laughs> This is a really exciting drink. It's very simple. Uh, I love drinks like this that uh, use equal parts of all the ingredients, and, and this is one of those. So we're going to begin with three quarters of an ounce dry gin, and this is per cocktail, so three quarters ounce per drink. Maraschino liqueur, freshly squeezed lime juice, and lastly, this is the really exciting ingredient, green chartreuse. It's a little bit herbal, it's a little bit sweet. And that's of course all over ice in a shaker. We're gonna shake that for a good 30 seconds. For this, I like a very clean cocktail. I'm gonna double strain it into a coupe For me, this is already sweet enough, so we're gonna leave it ungarnished. There we are, here's your last word. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Yeah, that'll do. Quite complex. Yeah, Interesting. It's very thing. nice for a cool January day. A little licorice Yeah, so. So very excited about this week for a lot of reasons. It's a really nicely constructed program two pieces. I see a lot of connections between the two of them. I'm curious to see what your thoughts are and the way that these two pieces fit together. Well, it's a concert that has two pieces in a minor key, which is quite unusual. Yeah. First of all, Mozart's C minor piano concerto, K491. Mozart didn't write a whole lot of music in minor keys. The other famous example, of course, is the D minor piano concerto that we opened the season with. And when he writes in a minor key, there's something stormy and ill at rest in the music, which we very much hear. It's, it's as romantic and brooding a mood as Mozart ever finds, right. um, which is a very good description of Sibelius's first symphony, which is an E minor key that not very many symphonies were written in until Brahms's fourth came along and everybody suddenly thought, oh, E minor is an interesting key mm -hmm. for a symphony. But it's absolutely romantic and brooding from its very first notes. Um, timpani rolling like the sound of the wind in the background, this very brooding clarinet solo that, that will then come back in the last movement. I think really one of the most original first symphonies mm. that there ever was. Yeah. You know, if you think of Mozart's early symphonies, Haydn's early symphonies, Beethoven's early symphonies, mm -hmm. they all very much built on a tradition that was already there, particularly in Beethoven's case. Yeah. But then there are these examples in musical history like Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique, or Mahler's First Symphony, and I'd include with that Sibelius's first, that really seem to come from absolutely nowhere in their sheer originality. Yeah, be because so many composers who were not uh, living in Germany or Austria at the time were still so heavily influenced by that style that, you know, even Ch Tchaikovsky's symphonies, that Germanic tradition is so clearly embedded there. But Sibelius really found an originality, a voice that uh, was really expressing uh, not only his own originality, but also something that was very, uh, I don't know if nationalistic is the right term, but uh, celebrating um, you know, his homeland. And yeah. uh, it, it, what, are, what are some of the you know, basic structural differences between what he's doing and other devices and in that Germanic tradition that was so dominant in the 19th century? Well, like I said, the first movement begins with a clarinet solo that then has no relationship to the rest of the first movement. It comes back as the beginning of the finale. Um, but Sibelius, he, I mean, he uses a sonata form like we would expect in a, in a first movement. Um, but the way that he constructs his themes is based on intervals, the distance between the notes. Um, and we can hear a very kind of tightly organized connection between every different melody in the whole piece. Yeah. The second movement, um, he originally has a, had a subtitle for it, which was 
the northern pines imagine the southern palm trees. And he later scribbled that out and said, no, no, it's just music. But it's a very useful way for us to understand the atmosphere of this music because every note of Sibelius sounds like it could only have been written in the north, you know, in Finland, almost in the Arctic Circle, almost in Lapland, yeah. with snow and whiteouts and that kind of fierce, majestic beauty of the northern landscape, yeah. as opposed to the more erotic, welcoming uh, aspects of southern music. So the second movement is very much a love song to the south from the north. And the scherzo is a really kind of powerful, hammering scherzo like you might hear in a Bruckner symphony. Mm -hmm. One little simple idea, bum 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 ba da dum bum, that comes back many times. Um, and again, there are moments in that when you can imagine being tied to the back of a sled, on, on a sled with huskies pulling you through the, the winter wonderland. Very evocative music. And then a finale which is often compared to Tchaikovsky. You know, people often say that Sibelius' first symphony is very much indebted to Tchaikovsky because he ends the symphony with a really big tune, just like the first piano concerto ends or the fifth symphony. Um, I have to say that even though Sibelius would have been very familiar with Tchaikovsky's music, particularly since Finland was part of the Russian Empire when he was writing. That's very much one, something he was writing against. Mm -hmm. The Finnish yep. wanted independence, which they would get a few years later. Yep. Um, I don't really hear Tchaikovsky at all, but Tchaikovsky would have been a model that he saw a lot. So, okay, you can say he writes a big tune just like Tchaikovsky, but that's about it. Yeah. I don't hear much else similarity. Um, what I do hear is a fascinating precursor of what's to come in Sibelius's following six symphonies, um, which is this increasingly tightly organized structure. The music getting shorter and shorter, being able to say what it wants to in fewer and fewer notes. Mm -hmm. Which is very different than some of his contemporaries in the latter part of the 19th century were doing, which is figuring out how to get into grander and grander scales. Make everything as big as possible, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, it's also, I think, a piece that's a little underplayed. You know, we tend to hear Sibelius' second and fifth symphonies all the time. I've never conducted the first before, and that was partly because I didn't really see what was so great about it, and the experience of studying it over the last couple of years for these performances uh, has really changed my mind. This is one of the most thrilling and original symphonies there is. Um, the excitement and the drama and the restless energy that we hear from the very beginning of the Allegro in the first movement permeates the piece right to its final notes. And it's a piece that doesn't let you go. It doesn't end triumphantly like so many of his other symphonies. It ends with a kind of petering out of energy still in E minor. It's a piece that holds you right to the, its very last notes. Yeah. Um, and I find that very powerful. So. Um, seven total symphonies that he wrote, and this puts you right on the precipice of a complete cycle of all seven during your tenure here in Jacksonville. Which one's left? We still have the fourth to do, mm. predictably the last because it's the very strangest and the most difficult to program, mm -hmm. um, but that's coming soon as well. Yeah. And then, also very exciting this week, we're welcoming Conrad Tao, who is just one of the most creative artists out there in the performing world today and he's not even yet 30 um, but really a an artist who started life as a very promising prodigy and has lived up to that I mean and, and he's wildly just creative um, and of course as a composer as well as a pianist composer um, pian yeah. which I think is a really nice thing in terms of him coming to play this particular Mozart concerto um, because like I said at the beginning, C minor is one of the strangest Mozart concertos. Um, it's famous that its opening theme in the first movement uses all 12 chromatic pitches of the keyboard, which is very unusual for Mozart in, in a tonal piece of music. So it's a piece that I think is a kind of particularly a piece that interests composers as well as performers. So the fact that we have a soloist who embodies or wears both those hats. Yeah. It's going to be really exciting. It is, and um, I've said this many times already this season, um, but when we programmed this um, uh, sort of mini cycle of five Mozart concertos this year, 
uh, for this season. They're all written within about, well, less, a little more than one year on the calendar in Mozart's lifetime. And what's so remarkable about that is not only are they all essentially perfect as much as you can say that, but they're all such unique pieces unto themselves, which is remarkable for being written in that amount of time. Never mind, he also wrote Marriage of Figaro at the same time. Uh, and, uh, and it's really great that we have five very different and unique pianists um, who all bring sort of a distinct voice. And I agree, I think this is absolutely the perfect one of these five for, for him to explore. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you, it's another chance for you to hear our brand new Steinway D. Mm -hmm. um, this concert in particular is dedicated to the memory of David M. Hicks, Ann Hicks, late husband, uh, in whom the gift for all this piano concerto series and the instrument in which you hear them being played mm -hmm. was made. So we're looking forward to honoring him and her yeah. as well. Absolutely. So uh, we'll be there Friday and Saturday evenings, 7.30 in Jacoby Symphony Hall. Would love to see you there. Um, and uh, thanks for making a really interesting uh, and I think perfect program for a sort of a chilly January weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. See you soon. Cheers. Cheers.